Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. What's interesting to me is that corroboration of the light. Mm -hmm. And they both felt something had transpired there that was unusual. You know, his, his recounting of the properties of the light, how it didn't seem to allow shadow. Like yeah. it just enveloped the inside of the van. And then her memory of the spinning and the being sucked out. I can see why your mind tries to rationalize it like it's all a dream probably. It has to be a dream. How could that have actually happened? Actually happened, actually happened, actually happened, actually happened, actually happened. Happen. John, you think you were abducted? Like n- maybe, maybe, but I don't know if I told you this later on, but right in the same ear spot, not directly, but in the ear, like I would wake up with blood and like, Ugh. Um, n- not a lot, okay. just a tiny little prick. Ooh, yeah, like, like they, they, it, they altered something. Like near it. <sighs> really? And it happened like, Four or five times within like a, a month period. Weird, man. Like a little stream of blood, but then like a like a poke, like where something was poked. I've heard that with implants before. Oh, good. Are you a star child, John? Star child. There are so many traumatic cases of abduction, but you hear all the time, and a lot of the contactee movement is like, if they're all benevolent, and like, if they've worked the technology to travel to visit us, oh, they right. must have gotten past all the negative all aspects. The aggression. Yeah. It could be government, too. That's true. That's a whole I can other totally angle. see there being like, when the Europeans first landed on the Americas, and like the tribal people were like, children, come look. If they traveled all the way across the oceans, they must have <laughs> overcome all hatred and anger. <laughs> Please come into our Feed homes. Them. <laughs> Let's use their blankets oh, and see sad. how things go. Oh, dark. You know what I just thought about real quick? What Which is you think really about? freaky. Remember that dream I mentioned the other day that my friend had and told me? She was trying to get me to talk to three children that I didn't know I had. <laughs> Alien hybrid babies. That's pretty intense. What if you had had some premarital intercourse with a reptilian lady? Oh, come on. Premarital. <laughs> that would suggest that there might have been well, a marriage down the point. road. There's probably going to be some sort of reptilian <laughs> ceremony. I would hope. <laughs> what? Conspiracy, synchronicity, Sasquatch, homunculus, alien races, Satanism in Hollywood, MK Ultra, Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Like, Close the door, in. jury. Close your dark. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman. Bohemian Grove. Corey Feldman. Magicians are demons. Spectres. Spirits. Spirits. Sleep paralysis. Muslim Islamicists. The gender spectrum. Yes. Alternative history. Shadow people. Shh, quiet, I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. That's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about it. That's old. Y2K. Cover-ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Welcome, friends, to episode number... I don't know what number this is. Season 2, episode 10. Season 2, episode 10. Which is... Oh, that bird almost crashed through your window, John. That was terrifying. You know what? That bird keeps trying to run into the window. It's really weird. <laughs> you know, Randall has birds like that. It's what does stupid. it look like? It was a bird. It had wings. Maybe it's a screen memory that we're having in the present. He looked like he was mad at me last time I saw him. I walked in the room and he was like, <laughs> <laughs> did, did like four it? times. Yeah, he hit like the window. hard. Yeah. Wow. And I had to actually put this blocker thing up there so in case it broke the window, he wouldn't come get me. Did he make eye contact? Yeah. Like he looked at you as he smashed yeah, the window. Yeah, he, he provoked me. He's like, me. this is about you. <laughs> he did. He looked very angry like I stole his baby or something. You did this. It was weird. Oh, gosh. That's you dark. did this. That's an odd connection, isn't it? Because we're going to be talking about abductions today, right? Yeah. That's our topic of interest. A topic that I'm surprised we haven't really gotten into on the show after two seasons. And there is that parallel, right? With alien abduction and owls. Mm-hmm. Isn't that a thing? Yes. There's a whole thing with owls and, you know, are they screen memory for your abductors, your extraterrestrial abductors? We're not really going to get into that today. There's so much you can do with alien abduction, but we wanted to <laughs> so much you can do with it. I wanted to get into some of the more unusual, unheard of things. Just just a brief intro into alien abduction and then get into some uh, maybe famous folks who've been abducted. Because I always think that's kind of interesting when there's someone you... Famous people are important. Quote, unquote, no. Are we talking about... Um, who are those one people? We mentioned Betty and Barney Hill. Yeah. We're not going to go into those because I feel like that's such a... It's been covered so many times and... If we wanted to down the road, we could do a more of a breakdown, historical, chronological, you know, abduction stuff. The stuff that I think a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with. Um, but I wanted to cover ones that were maybe a little less commonly heard of. Uh, one particular mm-hmm. one 
that comes from long, long ago days of the 1800s during kind of the airship flap back oh, then. Oh, yes, the um, famous airship flap. But it's sort of an attempted abduction, which is why I thought it would fit well in today's episode. Mm-hmm. We should also mention that coming up in this episode, one of the special things about this episode is that we have an interview. Absolutely. With the noted author, Daniel Krause. Yes. New York Times bestseller. And yeah, and his book was excellent, Bent Heavens. And we'll get into more of that in the second part of the show. So we decided to do an abduction episode because we were covering his book. We had the great interview. And we also had a write-in uh, from a listener we with did. a pretty fantastic oh, that abduction was crazy. story. Yeah, so that's going to be really fun to cover. But I thought it's funny. It, it, we haven't had done an abduction episode. I don't know. I think it's because we did a lot of like UFO episodes in the first season. Yeah. With Area 51 stuff. Tic Tac shaped UFO. I think yeah. I was abducted. Yes. And we <laughs> talked about John's abduction. Did I don't ever tell you about, like, I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but um, you know who Whitley Strieber is? Yeah. Like, Strieber? Uh, Strieber. Is it Strieber? Strieber. Oh, yeah. What's <laughs> the street bird? I have, like, a weird thing in my ear that I, it just appeared one day. And it was when I was like going through some weird stuff, thinking like aliens were definitely real. And the, oh, it was after the UFO sighting that I had. Right, in Austin. Yeah. But the weird thing about it was when I felt that thing in my ear, I was like, what, where, what the fuck is this thing? And then I heard a voice in my head say, Whitley Strieber. That's I'd so never bizarre. have heard of him before That's that. That's so crazy. I looked it up and he's talking about UFO abductions and, and chip yeah. technology. Dude, maybe you are on the same ship with Whitley. Maybe you guys get routinely abducted together and he's one of your like buddies, like the buddy system for or, abductees. Or Whitley has a really good marketing team. Because he's, you know, he's got that book Communion he wrote. They turned yeah, but how movie. did it get in my head? Yeah. Just randomly. His marketing Never. team works Whitley with Whitley Strieber or whatever. I typed, it was just like, look exactly this guy Exactly what. Up. That was when I started freaking out. I was like, what the hell is going that on? That is an in my odd life? connection. It's probably because it's such a common name. Yeah, right. <laughs> Whitley Strieber. <laughs> well, it's funny because in, in the, you know, the circles that we run and the, the topics that we're interested in, we cover, uh, that's a big name. But you yeah. wouldn't, I mean, you may have s- maybe subconsciously come across his name, but... To know that that's directly connected to right. implants yeah. and then yeah. have that name pop in your head. John think, wasn't researching UFO abduction and right. aliens and no. when you're living in Austin. I can't say for sure I'd never heard his name before, but it was so in the back radar of anything that I would, you know, but it was just like crystal, just come out crystal and, yeah. clear. It's like, look up this guy. And, and then, yeah. Yeah. That is I bizarre, I guess it could man. be your real, it could be like your, like a strong sense of the subconscious knowing what yeah. to suggest to you looking it's really not impossible but it still freaked me out at the time right. like it it's just more likely seemed, aliens telling yeah, you I think, there, I think so <laughs> I think there was an alien up in the craft like just looking down through his monitor screen he had a microphone he's got a like, microphone his friend was like Steve tell me about Whitley he's like, tell me about Whitley there's a there's a chip in your ear and this is coming directly from our microphones and aliens and it would be great if he had told you all that. <laughs> we're aliens and uh, we have microphones. And also, when I'm, um, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but Small Town Monsters, our friends, did this eight-part documentary oh, yeah. um, called On, On the, the Trail, Trail of, of UFOs. UFOs. And I did all the sound for it. And uh, when I was watching the section on abductions, dude, it was very, it was like I was almost like flashback type stuff. Weird. Really? I don't PTSD. remember. It was just during thinking about that time period in my life. And it was just like, I felt the same feelings that those UFO people were yeah. talking about. Well, it's so funny too, because you this you weren't super inter- interested in this stuff at the time. And the funny thing no, is- No, I've never been interested. The ear, you know, Whitley Strieber? Yeah. His implant was behind his ear. That's where mine is. Yeah. A little bizarre. That is I weird. don't even want to get it looked at. Is this, is, oh, it's still there? Yeah. Dude. I have an alien bump on my head. I mean, it could be a growth, but it's like a long- like cylindrical, mm-hmm. cylindrical. It has never changed in size and just appeared one day. Weird. Yeah, I have an alien bump on my head, but it's... But if I ever need a job, person that's listening to this, none of this is true. I'm just making it all up. <laughs> well, you're afraid people are going to like blacklist <laughs> no, you for being... it. It's funny, I, when I was going through those celebrity accounts, there were so many accounts that were celebrities who had said they'd had abductions and after getting ridiculed, recanted. So I kept mm-hmm. the three good ones where they didn't recant. Danny, Danny Aykroyd. Is oh, he he's a great there? one. I, I didn't include him because I... His, he's abductive? He's seen a lot of craft. Okay. And it, there was one that went directly over him. The third kind, not but fourth I, kind. Yeah, I didn't see any quotes about him actually remember being abducted or anything, so I left oh, his out. But okay. I'd love to have him on sometime. I'm sure he'll come on. Yeah. You would pee your pants. You'd be so I nervous. Would. <laughs> I would be too, but I think you'd be super nervous. I don't think I'd be nervous because I feel like I know him because I, we grew oh, up with him. come on. A little bit. That makes it even weirder. No. I mean, it depends. It's, I've seen him talk so much that I feel like he's like it an would uncle. Be easy to yeah. I'm with sure him. once you started the interview, you'd be fine. Right. Uncle Danny, 
He feels yeah. like good old Uncle Dan. Start calling like, him Uncle Dan. <laughs> Do you not care about my alien bump? Was, you go ahead and tell us about your alien to, bump. I mentioned it like it's four a, times. It's like a cyst, ca- isn't it? Carry on. It's no. a fatty cyst. Mom calls it a fatty win. She said <laughs> She said dad had them all over and he got them removed and they opened them up and pus came out. But on oh, mine, come on. But mine is just, it feels kind of like a horn and it's on my yeah. head, you know? When did it form? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember exactly. Blacked out and woke up and it was there like years ago. Now that you're finally starting to get a little bit of a bald spot, a little bit of recession going on, it's starting to peek through like Mount Everest through the clouds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it's not that big. It's getting there. My hair's not that thinning. But, uh, it's but it, it does heat up. It does heat up when I work out, which is interesting. Or if I'm really stressed, it gets hot. Does it produce energy? You plug your phone Think, into yeah, it. Yeah, you could like maybe power your home with it. It's like, like a cell phone charger connected to it on my cell phone. Yeah. Anyways, it's probably just a a cool bump that I have. Probably not an alien implant, but I do talk to it. Excuse me. I think about it sometimes. I mean, I, I, I don't think it, you know per, emotionally about it, but I feel it's been with me for so long. You talk to it sometimes. If Come it's on. like hot, I'll say like, "Cool down, bud." You know, let's not get crazy up there. <laughs> maybe uh, I don't really maybe we get it. older, da- you can start putting like coolers on it, like Dad does around his ears. Dude, when, when, next time we do a show, I should get mini headphones I can put on my bump. So like okay. we both are wearing headphones. <laughs> All right, <Let's> get- <laughs> this is weird. It's <laughs> very strange. It's a weird conversation. That it's not would be that big. like little baby headphones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can put earmuffs on in the winter. Mr. When it gets cold. Yeah, accessorize them. So do you, uh, do you, John? Do you think you were abducted? Like if you I had don't to, know. if you had to say, because there was a point I had to say I. I I don't know. Yeah. I don't think it's impossible. I don't know. I wouldn't, you know, say for sure no. Yeah. You know. It would have happened to, you're thinking if it did it would have been maybe that night oh, yeah. where you saw the triangular shape. Maybe yeah, right. maybe or maybe that was like what started, but I told I don't know if I told you this later on, which is part of what this clip is going to be about later somewhat. But right in the same ear spot, not directly but in the ear, like I would wake up with blood and like, Ugh. um, n- not a lot, okay. just a tiny little prick. Ooh, yeah, like they like they altered something, like near it. Yeah. And this was in the last year or two. Really, We're being activated again, and it happened like four or five times within like a, a month period. Well, like, are we talking like a, a little stream of blood, or just a dot, or what? Are we like talking? a little stream of blood, but then like a like a poke, like where something was poked. Weird. Yeah. I've heard that with implants before. There would oh, be good. like a little bit of a, ble- a bleed the following morning, especially if it's after a recent abduction, whether it was implanted then. All or, right, let's forget about this. Are you this a star thing. child, John? <laughs> are you gifted to what us? What if he's a hybrid? Saber world? He might be a hybrid. I do have, I don't know if we're going to get to it. You are taller than us. I have an article <laughs> on uh, sexy hybrids, these girls who claim that they're hybrids, and they, oh, yeah. they talk about their uh, sexual experiences with reptilians. Um, I don't know if we're going to have time for oh, that. Here we go. But maybe in the Patreon. <sighs> well, we'll see. I'm getting, I'm oh, feeling weird. <laughs> <laughs> feeling weird. <laughs> all right. Well, all if right. I am an abductee, then uh, I turned out okay. Yeah you're, yeah, you're hanging in there. You're you're working. Yeah, you're working for them. They're, they better be good then, because I've refused to work with bad things. Yeah. What if you were like a reptile hybrid? Like you didn't want. I would know. I would be an evil person, right? I don't know. Are all reptilians evil? I don't know. There is the good. What is the the feathered reptilians? The bird like feathered yeah, ones. Oh, like yeah, like the Quetzalcoatls of the. Yeah, I've heard that. Alien lord that are gifters of knowledge. I'm sure if, if there are aliens out there, whatever that means, interdimensional or otherwise, in I, Earth, there probably are mixed bag. good and bad ones. Just like there's good and bad humans. Right. They probably have generally can be more malevolent or benevolent towards a certain, you know, race, race of humans or whatever. Like they might have like a philosophy. Uh, sort of towards a race of different humans? Like a race of, like the race of humanity. You know what I mean? Like they might be like, we don't right. like this group, yeah. we like this group. So we... Really? You mean, you think that they look at different races within humanity? No, no, I mean the race of humanity. <laughs> Human oh, race. Right. Yeah, not, I don't know, like they don't he like means, black people. I, that's what yeah. I thought you meant. I was like, you think they get <laughs> like that a racist, specific? Like the racist Trachillians <laughs> or something? It could be. It's possible. It but, is possible. Uh, I don't know. Well, it's funny because there's always that you hear all the time, and a lot of the contactee movement is like, if they're all benevolent, they're like, if they've worked the technology to travel to visit us, oh, they right. must have gotten past all the negative all aspects the aggression. of aggression. Right. right. But it's, that seems like such a, I don't know. Just like humans. Right. They hear, you hear all these <laughs> traumatic cases of abduction. I'm not saying they're all bad, but there are so many traumatic cases of abduction to say, like, oh, just because they're telling you they're here to help you doesn't necessarily mean it they're helping you. It could be government, too. That's could, true. That's a I whole other totally angle. I could totally see there being like when the the, the white Europeans first landed in on the Americas and like the tribal people were like, children, come look. If they traveled all the way across the oceans, they must have overcome all hatred War. and anger. Please come into our Feed homes. Them. <laughs> Bring them in. Let's use their blankets oh, and see sad. how things go. Oh, dark. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, it's such a silly idea to think that all, you know, 
race. I mean, I understand that, like, you, they must have evolved to a certain point. Yeah, because they could have accidentally found a dimensional portal. You oh, know, well, like, that, that also that comes from the idea that, like, you can only go so far without switching to love or something. Right, and yeah. I think that's just a like a new age mythology. Right. I don't think that that's true. Well, I mean, yeah. Also, think about think about ideologies that propel people into technological advancements that you couldn't. Yeah, even they're imagine. usually uh, usually darkness. Yeah, it's usually that. about like. Uh, somehow pushing other certain people away and focusing on a certain directive. And that oh, yeah. can sometimes really move forward progress. And Look at the have government military projects with the internet mm-hmm. and, you know, yeah. all that stuff came from destruction in right. some level, like right. wanting to be the most powerful. Yeah. The argument against that would be the, if there are ones that come here energetically, right? Quote, like the yeah. new age idea of like... And that may be true. Know. I'm sure that there probably, if there is this mix of you know, different types of aliens. There's probably some that did come here that operate on a different level, right. you know, of intelligence and spirituality. Like, um, yeah, what's the one that eats cats? Elf? Elf. He's a good guy. <laughs> he's not a, he's not real. Sad ending, but that's serious, by the way. Um, Spoiler alert. But speaking of Indians, we're not going to go back that far, but I thought it'd be fun to Native start Americans. with. Yeah, there was this guy, you guys probably haven't heard of this account. I hadn't heard of this account but um, there is this little known thing called paleo abductions. Really? Yeah. These are abductions that predate the popular contemporary story. Like the, the famous Betty Barney Hiller was like, oh, that's the first alien abduction published version. Uh-huh. But, but these aren't like, not. They're not like prehistory, like paleo. No, 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 not like paleo man. I mean, okay. you could argue there's plenty of cases, especially if you look at biblical texts, that could be abduction cases, scenarios. They just didn't write about them. Right. <laughs> but this was the first like published in modern contemporary history, but not current day. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So if you guys want to dig into this one, I've titled it Abduction Fail, 1896. Oh, so going to be in the show notes? Yeah. And the guy who coined this term, uh, Jerome Clark, coined this term, paleo abductions. Good guy. A lot of uh, UFO research. He's been on tons of programs, and he's also a folk singer-songwriter, if you care to look in. All right. That's he's enough on that. He's a good guy. <laughs> he's a folk singer-songwriter, really. Mm-hmm. I, I was right. wondering if it was related Shut to Gary Clark, up. but I don't think Shut so. Shut your mouth. Okay. The November 19th, 1896 edition of the Stockton, California Daily Mail featured one of the earliest accounts of an alleged alien craft sighting. Colonel H.G. Shaw claimed that while driving his buggy through the countryside near Stockton, he came across what appeared to be a landed spacecraft. Shaw described it as having a metallic surface which was completely featureless apart from a rudder and pointed ends. He estimated a diameter of 25 feet and said the vessel was around 150 feet in total length. Three slender, seven-foot-tall apparent extraterrestrials were said to approach from the craft while emitting a strange warbling noise. The beings reportedly examined Shah's buggy and then tried to physically force him to accompany them back to the airship. The aliens were said to give up after realizing they lacked the physical strength to force (laughs) the muscular Shah aboard. (laughs) Really? Well, I shouldn't say muscular, but (laughs) it's a weird thing. They supposedly fled back to their ship, which lifted off the ground and sped out of sight. Shah believed that the beings were Martians sent to kidnap an earthling for unknowable and potentially nefarious purposes. This has been seen by some as an early attempt at alien abduction. It is apparently the first published account of explicitly extraterrestrial beings attempting to kidnap humans into their spacecraft. That's like the like Martians got here and they're van like... driving around. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. It's like, guys, we gotta I get got stronger. Some candy. We gotta start working out if we're gonna do this seriously, guys. It was pretty well, hilarious. I thought, it's weird that they weren't strong enough. Yeah. Shut up, Bill. You get in there first. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, like, uh if it's if it's a true account. Well, they didn't think that like, far ahead. Ah. <laughs> and they're hilarious that it would be. It's definitely consistent as far as the report being about these seven foot tall slender beings. Right. So when did this happen? This was eighteen 18- 1896. So it predates, you know, all the ones you hear about. Yeah. At least the attempted abductions. And this is during that airship flap, which some of you guys might be familiar with that happened across the country, which was probably not extraterrestrial. Yeah. Probably. I mean, that's sort of an example of potentially... Uh, early it, breakaway civilization. Exactly. Yeah. Where we were working on advanced technology, experimenting with it, people were seeing in the sky. But Have you ever heard about that, John? That's pretty fascinating. This flap of airship sightings before we had flight. But it'd be like, there were reports of like these things flying in the air, but then there would be humans bicycle powering them, 
and they'd have tail really? fins and things like that, and you'd hear them like more elevation. Really? And yeah, it was just very strange. So it's obviously so, like some like advanced. Yeah, the one of the stories, and there's there's a lot of research into this, which is pretty interesting. But they discovered certain elements that allowed them to have lift like almost an anti-gravity Ooh. gas. And so the argument is like this could have been the potential beginning of the breakaway civilization back in the early 1800s when they were discovering how to get off the ground before the Wright brothers had their first flight. Oh, so mm. not, not using necessarily Bernoulli's principle right. with some other element. Could it have been that uh, Bob Lazar oh, element? Oh, yeah, I didn't even think about that. I mean, I doubt I mean, it's it. It's probably but totally different. What about yeah. helium? Helium, but there you go. There's right. an element that would actually help with that Except purpose. for the flammable aspects. And hydro- was hydrogen uh, hydrogen. One? Yeah. Well, that was the, I think the... The Lindenburg? Yeah, I must have the, the Hindenburg. Gu- the Gutenberg. <laughs> the Gutenberg. <laughs> wow. We smart. Uh, yeah, the that's Hindenburg. press guy. That's a smart one, Bill. That's a... Uh, what's that from? I don't know. <laughs> like Bill, Bill's your go-to. That's a smart one. <laughs> I learned it up on the Google. But yeah, I like that account because it's, you know, it's it's one that predates all the others. And it's, I think it's the first published account. Yeah. So that was kind of interesting. No, that is interesting. Not really. John didn't like it. It wasn't scary enough. I, you know, I don't like much. That is true. <laughs> I'm joking. I thought it was good. <laughs> Thanks. You sold it. <laughs> Let's go. That's it's actually I like the I like those historical ones where, you know, there's a horse and buggy involved. It's, you know. I just wish we could talk about one that involved camping because that's what I really want to do right well, now. Well, we're, we're about camping. to, sir. No way. Really? Yeah. about camping? What are the odds? What are the odds? Like I have the show notes here in front of me. You do. Yeah, we let's, had a great write-in. Let's go camping. Oh, this is a write-in. Okay, I'm excited because yeah. this was a really good story from what I remember. I, I want to go camping. If we go camping, we should not go camping in Missouri. Is that where this takes place? That's where this happened. I do want to go camping, by the way. So who sent this in? Oh, this story comes from Amethyst Halverson. Oh, this is Amethyst's story. I do remember this. This is pretty excellent. So she, it's funny, she begins this letter with this statement. I've convinced myself it was just a dream. I have those now and then. The dreams that feel so real. The dreams you can smell and taste. The dreams that leave a darkness behind. Oh, well, they always dark. She's talking about specifically these certain dreams that right. seem so real. That's interesting because we, in the live stream we did, we talked a lot about dreams, and dreamscapes, yeah. and and premonition and dreams. Yeah, I, I'm going to say real quick what my dream was the other day. It was so freaky. It's just I'll just give you the real yeah, yeah. short version. But so it was like I got to the point in the dream, and someone's like, "Look through these glasses, through these glasses. to see what the matrix is." And I look through, and it was this skeleton that had tissue on it. Like, uh, it was a skeleton, but you could see its brain, and like it had eyes. This and it was just like, just like dancing. Yeah. And I was just like, <laughs> it, it was like, what? Like, I didn't want to look. And they were like, yeah. no, keep looking. No, keep looking. And it was just this keep feeling of just it. pure terror. Like, that's what's actually going on. That's very bizarre, man. It sounds just like they live. Yeah. Remember that? Mm-hmm. With Roddy Roddy yeah. Piper, because he looks through the glasses and then he sees these kind of zombie like skeletons. They do. They did look like that. It's weird. It's weird because I was just editing a clip with that last night. Weird. That's bizarre. But it, they kept trying to make me look, and I was just. It felt like I just wanted to run away. Yeah. You know? And then it like zapped me and like paralyzed me. You think they were? Who, who was trying to make you look? I don't remember. I just remember like say go look through that look that's through what's that. happening that's what's I was like, going no. On. no i don't want that the much nature. information yeah it was, uh, it was very much like that, that reminds me speaking of you know leaving your body alien abduction that sort of stuff we mentioned this before on the show i'd love to get into this there's these uh, accounts that people have had either out of body experiences or taking hallucinogenics psychedelic experiences but there's this connection where they travel especially with dmt to a certain point and at that moment they see this sort of humanoid creature with tons of the snake-like, almost like Medusa-like things, uh, and it's always looking over something. Mm-hmm. And then they get this impression like they're not supposed to be. There's something here. They went too far. They went too far. This is a gatekeeper. This is a protector. And then it turns around or begins to turn around. And that's oh, always gosh. where it ends. And they all say like, if this thing had made eye contact with him, they felt like they would be lost for eternity somewhere or something because it was creepy. just protecting right. this sacred truth or something. Very bizarre. That would be a good episode. That's kind of how it felt looking through that. That's what it reminds me of. It was just like, this is what runs stuff. It's way too much for you to understand. It's yeah, there's not, no going back once yeah, you look. It's just like, yeah. It was just, Take the red pill? All right, well, let's the read the pill. story what now. you get for being a hybrid, John? I know. You get deep looks in this information. <laughs> All right, so yeah, let's get back into Amethyst's story here. Yeah, take it away, John. My boyfriend Michael and I bought a house in January of 2016. I was 25 years old and had worked so hard to close on a little cracker box in Kansas City, Missouri. After the long hassles of moving and getting settled, we organized a camping trip in August. We have two dogs and enjoy spending time in the forest. We invited my sister and her two dogs to come along. 
I found a campground about a 45 minute drive away at Fleming Park in Lee's Summit, Missouri. The day came in the middle of the week. I packed up my POS of a minivan and headed out. When we arrived, we picked our spot towards the back of the campground, trying to be away from other parties scattered throughout. My sister met us there. It was close to evening time. We immediately got firewood and started to unpack. Upon unpacking, I discovered we forgot our tent poles. I didn't want to spend the hour and a half trip back to just get the poles, so Michael and I decided to just sleep in the van. We all went on an evening walk, then came back, lit the fire and had dinner, maybe an adult beverage or two. We called it a night and went to bed. Now, I don't know if you are aware, but in minivans, you can remove the bench seats, and we had already taken ours out to sit by the fire. So Michael, our two dogs, and I piled into the van. This was the most uncomfortable place I think I've ever slept. Those railings in the floor, they were digging into me. It was awful. It had to have been a few hours of tossing and turning, along with being so cold, I finally started to drift off to sleep. Next thing I know, the van is enveloped in a pure white light. I hate light when I'm sleeping. It has to be dark. I try to ignore it thinking it was night patrol with a flashlight, but it doesn't go away. It gets brighter. The van begins to move. It's spinning in circles. The engine in the center. The trunk hatch was open. The light is so bright, I can't see anything. The van is spinning so fast. I'm being sucked out of the van. I try to hold on, but can't move. I can feel the wind pulling me, tugging at me. The light drawing me out. I wanted to scream for help. I finally blink. It's dark outside. I'm freezing. I try to snuggle up between the dogs and Michael. They were all sleeping and quiet. I close my eyes. Again, the brightest light I've ever seen, and the van is spinning again, and I'm being sucked out. I have never been so scared and helpless. I eventually wake up in the sunrise. I get the fire going and try to warm up as the others stir. We eat breakfast and go about our hikes. I did not want to spend the night again. So we pack up that afternoon and return home. I decided not to say anything. A few weeks pass by. One night, Michael brings up our camping trip, and he asks me if I remember a bright light. My jaw dropped, and I told him I do. He proceeded to tell me about a bright white light, so bright he couldn't even see the pillars between the van windows, as in no shadows or silhouettes being cast. He then said he had body paralysis, couldn't move, not even to look for me. He said he wasn't cold, nor was he hot. The temperature was just perfect, and that was it. Neither of us remember seeing any creatures, but I know something happened that night. Since then, Michael has seen a spaceship in our backyard. On another instance, he mentioned dreaming of being taken by space travelers. I think it's all related. I haven't told Michael what I think. It would be my dream to have a worldwide confirmation of extraterrestrial life. I love what you gents do. I don't feel alone. I live a practical life, but fantasize in the unknown. Mm, Me too. Thanks again for all you guys do. I hope to be able to support you all once we get back to our regular work schedules. If you have any questions, you can find me here. Much love, Amethyst. Thank you, Amethyst. What a weird, freaky story. Yeah, and I can relate to to some degree. And also... um, And also not as much. Being spun in a van. Well, I'm just saying, like, the feeling of... uh, of wanting to know, like wanting that oh, disclosure yeah. and just feeling like you've had some personal experience. Right. Just waiting for that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic and out there. But it, I mean, what's interesting to me is that corroboration of the light, mm-hmm. you know, and they both felt something had transpired there that was unusual. You know, his his recounting of the properties of the light, how it didn't seem to allow shadow. Like it, yeah. it, it just enveloped the inside of the van. And then her memory of the spinning and the being sucked out, you know, happening twice in the evening. So yeah, I can see why you would, your mind tries to rationalize it. Like it's all a dream probably. It has to be a dream. How could that have actually happened? And you said you found some other cases in the area or something? Yeah, there's there were a few cases that summer at least Summit that I found. One uh, in July and one in May. Um, one was a changing light that was dim red and blue, bright white, then vanishing. Um, and the other, what year was this? 2016. Okay. And the other one was very similar to theirs. It was a bright, strange light that seemed to grow and grow. And that was a month before 
in May. Hmm. And we'll have, I'll have a link to this. And this is that Norfolk website. Oh yeah, we've linked to before. Um, if you're ever interested in seeing if you know in your hometown there's been any reportings, uh, they have like little descriptions, and then I think you can click on them, and then they get even more detailed. Yeah. What is that like Northern UFO Reporting Center or something like that or North right. American or something? So here's a huge dark gray domed saucer with white lights. It's a whole other event in Lee's Summit, Missouri, yeah. which I could read right now, but I'm not going to. But there are we'll the people notes. in their apartment experience this. Really interesting stuff. 2011, Lee's Summit, Missouri, large black craft uh, with blue and red square rectangular lights on the bottom, two circles connected. There's another post. This is from 2011 in October. Yeah. So obviously it's an area where there is stuff that goes on. Right. And if we had more time in this episode, maybe we, if we do another abduction episode where we don't have an, also an interview, we could do more corroboration accounts in the areas where we have the listener mm, You could do a whole show just to, dedicated to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, like a podcast. A yeah. It, I mean, people do. Oh, yeah. You could do a show just on alien abduction. I feel right. like we say that almost with every episode. We'd like giants or whatever. It's always In other like, words, we're probably never going to have run out of things to talk about. Yeah. There's always going to be plenty. But thank you for sharing that story. Yeah, thanks so much, Amethyst. That was one of one of our most, I think, uh, uniquely bizarre stories. Does Amethyst mean something? It's a kind of it's rock, a stone. Yeah. Okay. That I think is used also in like sort of new age things too. There's a properties about Amethyst. I forget what properties exactly. That's a cool name to have. If it's is that your real name, Amethyst, or is it a pseudonym like R.C. Christian? Who built the Georgia Guidestones? That's oh, coming up in our Patreon section. Dun, dun, dun. In the expansion episode. So hang in for that. Yeah, that's a beautiful name, Amethyst. Almost as pretty as Jeremy. <laughs> um, do you guys want to take a break? I think it's a pretty good spot. Yeah, let's take a little break. And then when we come back, we are going to get into some special famous people that have had encounters, right, Chris? Yeah, that. And I think maybe even before that, uh, we have a clip from Small Town Monsters on the show of UFOs that John grabbed for us with a really good account from an experiencer. Oh, from On the Trail of UFOs? Yeah, his name is um, Gary Tribert. He's an interesting guy. He definitely had lifelong experiences that would come and go. Cool. And then after that, our final part of the show is going to be our really fun interview we had with uh, Daniel Krause yeah. about his book, Bent Heavens. So stick around for that, guys, and we will see you after the break. I do, I do, it's all real. They're outside, right? No one's available to take your call. You can leave your story at the sound of the tone. No, 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 They're outside right now. They're outside. No. Do you have a spooky story? Don't wait until it's too late. Give us a call. Beliefhole.com. We are back, everyone. Thank you for coming back and being with us in this time of great excitement. <laughs> well this said. time of great excitement. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited for this clip, John, from the Small Town Monsters crew. Yeah. You guys definitely should check this out. It's on Amazon, Yep, I believe. Well worth your money. Yes, for sure. Amazon Video. I think it's, isn't that called Amazon Prime? I use it. I just assumed it was called Prime. It doesn't Prime. matter. It's on Amazon and it's awesome. You guys should check it out. Yeah, it's an eight-part series on interactions with UFOs over the last hundred years or so. Interviewing eyewitness accounts. Some accounts I don't think have been heard before. At least these tellings of them. Yeah. And I did all the sound work on it, so it's you know it's going to be dope. <laughs> Yeah, and you guys, you guys have heard us talk about Small Time Monsters before. Their stuff's always great, so definitely check out. Good people, good content, good information. They are local. They are our neighbors. That's yeah. right. They're right down the street. Oddly mm -hmm. local. They live in Dogman territory. Mm -hmm. Pretty close, yeah. Near the Silver Creek area. All right, gents. This, is, uh, this guy's name is Gary Tribert, I'm guessing. He's definitely one of the more compelling experiencers in the abductee uh, portion of the episodes. So I just took a little bit of a snippet from this and sit back, fluff your pillow, enjoy this for you. <laughs> for you. Um, we live by a quarry, so there was uh, like a mountaintop at the end of my road. This is when he was young. I saw a craft there in the daytime when I was a little boy. You know, my whole childhood growing up, I had these experiences. And I saw this craft over the trap rock, and uh, 
I told my father at one point, and we walked up there. He took me by the hand and walked up the road, and he sent me back home because I couldn't climb up the mountain. And I don't know what he was going up there for, really. I guess he saw it, too. You know, I went back home. I'm not really sure if I went back home by myself or I waited for him to come down or, or, or what, but different things Arr. happened to me through my life at different periods. And we moved from the house, I think when I was about 10 years old, we moved from where we were to a, another town. And I don't remember any experiences happening until I got married and I moved, I moved up here. Interesting. Uh, one night, I went to the store to get some beer. It was a Friday night. I kept getting this feeling to go out, to go out to the store. I didn't really want to go out. It was like one of the coldest nights of the winter. I remember seeing these lights moving through the woods that night. I went down this back road, and the store is about 10 minutes away. And as I made a right to follow this ridge, the, uh, this craft was kind of appeared over the ridge, and it kept pace with my car. As I drove along, and I kept looking up at it, and it was just moving with me over the trees. And at one point, I came around a turn, and it was down on the ground, this big light. And it looked like a big egg of shape, you know, but it was house size. Oh, wow. And there was creepy uh, mist swirling all around it. I, I distinctly remember. And, and I remember just having this feeling come over my body, it started tingling, and all my hair is like standing up. And the next thing I knew, I, I started my vehicle and drove off. And I, so I went down to the store, and when I got there, it was midnight. And I'd left the house about 10 o'clock. And anyway, I got some beer and I went home. I didn't drink it because it was too late already. But you know, I went home, my wife was hysterical. Were there physical effects from, from any of this that you can talk about? Or that well, after, after that event, I don't know if it was the same night, um, cause think a lot of things started happening after I had that encounter there on the road. Um, but one morning I woke up and there was dried blood coming out of my nose. It was well, there it is. dried all over my face. Um, scoops in the back of my neck here that you can put your finger in actually. Oh, wow. It's shaped in a triangle. I've heard that before, the scoops out of the flesh. Well, years later, uh, I, I had this is creepy. triplets and one morning when I went in to, I to triplets too. That's crazy. say goodbye to them. They all had blood coming out of their nose. You know, what? they were sleeping, but all of them had blood dried on their face coming out of their nose. Mm -hmm. Like what had happened to me as an adult, but. That's ridiculous. He was like almost crying right there. You could tell he was yeah. really choked up about it. Generational, oh. that's what I was gonna ask when you said it's been happening his whole life. A lot of times when they're lifelong abductees, allegedly there is this uh, carry on through the generations. Yeah, the generational I'm sure connection. it has to do with genetics. Like they're, it's, oh, yeah. if they're studying them, you know, well, for genetic purposes. It's funny because you, when it comes to like uh, fertility, mm -hmm. you know, reproduction, whenever you're more likely to have triplets, twins, quadruplets when you are using certain fertility treatments, you know, like that's a common thing. You know what I just thought about real quick? What did you think Really about? freaky. Remember that dream I mentioned the other day that my friend had and told me oh, that oh, she yeah. got Your in touch with me? <gasps> mm -hmm. What if those babies are half <sighs> alien? Okay, you need to back up. You need to explain because people weren't <laughs> on the live stream. Oh, that's true. You told on the live stream. Yeah, so I had a friend that I hadn't talked. I, I grew up with her and uh, we used to be really close friends and, you know, she has her own family now. I don't hear from her very often. She's had other, like, I don't know if it's prophetic, but other dreams with me. Every once in a while she'll text me, like, I had this really, like, vivid dream of you. And uh, she said that she, she said it was a good dream, but she was trying to get me to um, talk to three children that I didn't know I had. <laughs> Dude, that's weird, because when you were describing the dream, you were thinking, like, that obviously doesn't make sense, because... You know, you'd know if you yeah, had kids. Yeah, I would know, you know if I had. I mean, yeah, right. I haven't lived That's a like crazy life. the only like, example where you wouldn't know is if you were right. abducted by aliens. And your seed was put into, an, yeah. That's freaky. Alien babies. Alien hybrid babies. That's pretty intense. What yeah. if you had had some uh, premarital intercourse with a reptilian lady? 
Oh, come on. Premarital. <laughs> that would suggest that there might have been well, marriage down the point. road. There's probably going to be some sort of reptilian <laughs> ceremony. I would hope. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, it's, that's weird. That is bizarre. Yeah. Especially with all the synchronicity that seems to be happening. Yeah. Well, that would be a very, I don't know if I would ever know, but. Yeah. Well, hopefully you get to find it's out. It's all somewhere. tied together, man. You've got three alien kids. That just reminds me so much of those experiences with people. Like, if you look at a lot of abduction cases... They want my superiorly gen genetic sperm. That's what it is, yes. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> this guy's so... He's just so cool. We're going to make copies of him. Uh, no, but you have those cases where they're, they wake up and they... Well, actually, there was a really good movie, dude. John, I don't know if you watched this movie. Um, I know there aren't a lot of great movies out there these days, but there was a movie... I think it was with Annie from uh, Community... Uh, the character, oh, it was character. Yeah. I forget who the actress is and what the name of the movie is. We'll link in the show notes, but essentially it's about this girl. You don't know if she's going crazy, kind of losing it, because I think maybe her mom had issues, like mental issues. Um, but the whole time you're not sure if she's actually being um, abducted by something or if she's just kind of imagining it, but it's really well done. And at one point she just sees a guy crossing the street in front of the store she works at. And it's kind of like a quirky, weird film, independent. But this guy walks in front of the store and then she's like, that's the guy. Where do I know him from? And it turns out she knew him from, spoiler alert, the guy next to her on the craft during the abduction. Yeah, mm. it's called Horse Girl. Horse it's Girl. Awesome. Yeah. Dude, you got it's really good. I it's think what, it's on Netflix. It's one of the better sure. odd kind of offbeat movies. I've I've heard of experiences like that where they've met they've met on the craft and then somehow they came across. That's what I'm saying, yeah. man. Yeah. Whitley Strieber's on your ship, dude. You guys are ship partners. I feel like so that's funny. what's going on. He's like, do. hi, I'm Whitley Strieber. I wrote I wrote Communion starring Christopher Walkins. <laughs> Walkins? Or what? He's like, what, 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 what's his what name? brings Walken. you here? Oh, plural. What brings you here to the ship? What's a plural form of Christopher Walken? A Christopher Walkins. That's it's hilarious. A gaggle of Walkins. All right. Um, should we get back to it? Yeah. All right. So, what's our last bit here? We got uh, some, uh, what, celebrity uh, UFO? Yeah, abductions? I thought this was just fun anecdotal. Let's be real quick. Let's do it. Let's have um, fun. Let's have a little fun. It's about time with this yeah. crazy world we're in. Yeah. I always like to see who that the world knows. You know, people that might be well known have had experiences. You know, it doesn't necessarily Dennis validate Kucinich. the King of Pop. Elvis, yeah, the well, original Michael, Michael Jackson, the original was the King, King of, Pop. of Pop, the original. I thought he was the King of Rock and Roll. I guess he'd be just the King. He was the King. He was the yeah. King. Yeah. So let's start with Elvis. He was pre-pop. You want to read the Elvis guy? Oh yeah, of course. I'd be I'd be honored. That's weird though, because he did Elvis Presley's daughter married Michael Jackson. Really? Isn't that it's weird? Not that weird. Lisa Marie. Lisa Marie Presley married. Right? Am I yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, they did. They had a baby. Yeah, that, is, that is kind of weird. So you got to keep the king of popism in the family. Right, right, right. right. Royalty bloodlines, man. Ready? Mm hmm. The singer claimed that when he was eight years old, he was telepathically contacted by aliens who revealed a premonition of the singer wearing a white suit in front of a large audience. He was unaware of the meaning until he became a successful celebrity. His family even claimed a strange blue light shown over his home upon his birth. <laughs> That's crazy. Presley claimed several other encounters as well, primarily strange lights appearing overhead during nighttime drives. Two of these encounters were corroborated by his hairstylist, Larry Geller, once on a trip through Nevada, the other during a trek across Graceland. Interesting. A little Christ correlation there with the blue light right. over the house. Well, he thought he was somehow special in that way he was i would love to do an episode maybe in, as an expansion because it's a weird one but on the dark side of elvis he was i wonder if he was a satanist or a, he he definitely believed in occultic magic and uh he supposedly according to the people he worked for had tried to get one of them to kill somebody and like basically tried to use brainwashing to do it, what? like hypnotism almost. The way he like describes Elvis it. tried to hypnotize someone to have someone. Killed? He was like, "You will do this for me. You, will, we need this done." Mm. Kind of thing. His name, I think, is I think it's it was like one of his bodyguards, he was named, like Sonny or something. Yeah, uh, Elvis was. Uh, I think I have to look into this. We need this to stuff. do an episode yeah. on this. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself Jeremy's here. But, crazy cool. But no, I don't think it's that uh, unknown that he was into the. You might have dabbled into the call. Yeah. A lot of musicians I'm saying like yeah. new age stuff, that kind of thing. Because I know he was into like I think he was into channeling. There's a difference between yeah. new age and a call. Obviously, well, yeah, for I sure. I mean, they overlap. Right, but I think specifically Satan it's is a little right. more intense. I think well, with, cult in general is just uh, hidden, right? Is that's the definition? Yeah, for a cult. Yeah, I think, but I think there was a specific uh, 
I don't know. It, it, it's, it all comes down to this documentary I watched with interviews with his bodyguards and stuff. Oh. And it definitely was it was pretty dark. He was kind of losing it towards the end, and he did have kind of a God complex. So, Well, we'll look into that. I but mean, I'm not saying I don't like his music. Right. I'm Maybe just we'll, saying, we will uh, do a compendium to our um, Satanism in, the, in Hollywood music industry episode we did. Compendium. Season one. <laughs> I, wanted to, I like that. I think people like that episode. We might have to do another one, a deeper dive. That might disappear, too, as an early episode that we might be dropping off of our main channel. Yeah. So we'll have to. Yeah, we'll definitely have to do an updated Which version. One? Satanism in Hollywood and oh, the music man. industry. Cult music industry or something. Oh, boy. All right, Jeremy, you want to follow up on the next one? Yeah, let's get another guy in here. Sorry, Elvis fans. I'm not trying to hurt feelings out there. <laughs> um, I, I quit belief. Oh. This comes from the well-known Yafet Kato. Yafet Kato. The guy, oh, the guy from Aliens. Yeah. Wait, Aliens. Oh, the actor. Alien, the first one. That's what makes him interesting. I mean, that's what makes it interesting, his experience, because he played in the movie Alien, the original one with the chest burster. Oh, his name was Parker. Yeah. He was from Homicide Life on the Street. Okay, anyways. That was a great show. We'll clear this up with a picture in the show notes, guys. Uh, Yafet Koto, if I'm pronouncing that right. The actor claimed it started in childhood, noticing that the alien creature he met, quote, was at least five or six feet tall with an elongated head. From that moment on, it was one experience after another. Those sightings continued for a good 10 to 15 years. I've also had time loss. I have a big loss of time between some of these moments, and I'd often wonder if I was taken. At one point, Kodo claimed to have seen a UFO as big as, quote, the Yankee Stadium turned upside down. That's creepy. End quote. I just thought it was interesting because he was an alien, and he's apparently a lifetime abductee experiencer. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, maybe that's why they picked him, I would think. Maybe. It's meant to be. All right, last one here. Great film. John Lennon. I think everybody knows who that is. I've heard. This was interesting because this comes from his friend, close friend I did not know, was Yuri Geller, who we talked about on the show before. That's weird. He's good friends with John Lennon. And what was Elvis's hairstylist? Like Larry Geller? Uh, Were they related? I don't think so. Oh, you're right. It is a Geller. That's Mm -hmm. a weird coincidence. All right. So this, this comes from Yuri Geller's account of what John had told him. According to his friend Yuri Geller, the late singer claimed that in the early 70s, he was whisked away from his New York City apartment by four aliens with, quote, big bug eyes and little bug mouths. Mm. When Geller pressed on Lennon to expand about the encounter, Lennon reportedly said, quote, they did something, but I don't know what it was. I tried to throw them out, but when I took a step towards them, they kind of pushed me back. I mean, they didn't touch me. It was like they just willed me pushed me with willpower and telepathy. Lennon then claimed he'd found an egg-like object the creatures left behind and asked Geller to keep it, noting, quote, it's too weird for me. If it's my ticket to another planet, I don't want to go there. I wonder what Yuri did with that egg. Yeah. On another episode, we can get into alien implants. There's some really interesting stuff like Dr. Roger Lear. Lear. That's who Daniel Krauss brought up in the interview. And he's a guy who's done tons of research from 64 to 2014 before he died on alien abductions and people with implants and some crazy aspects to implants like they're highly magnetic in his experiences, emitting subspace frequencies, isotopic analysis that reports off-world elements. Really? And crazy ratios between these elements. And see, he was able to establish all this. Yeah, and he's, he's got books you can check out, The Aliens and the Scalpel. Mm-hmm. Um, we will do a fuller mm-hmm. episode mm-hmm. on that down the road. Well, that's the book that Daniel Krauss used his research for, Bent Heavens, the book we're about to interview him about. Oh, is that the same book? Yeah, what's it called? The The Aliens and the Scalpel. The Aliens and the Scalpel. He's got several books out. Awesome. Cool. Well, yeah, I think we touched on some interesting topics related. It's kind of a smattering, yeah. a spitting, if you will, of uh, alien abduction um, regalia. <laughs> regalia. Isn't that a good word? <laughs> that's a great word. Regalia. That's a great word. That's where regalia I don't think I used term. it correctly, but... Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we just touched on some of those... Um, some. It's such a large topic, obviously, and... Uh, but I think we got into some interesting stuff. Hey, how about, guys? How about you send a message in if you actually have had your own alien encounter? Absolutely. We had a great one from Amethyst today. Thank you so much. for That, that was awesome. Uh, guys, send them in to us. Uh, you can go to beliefhole.com. Um, contact us there. You can contact us, brothers at beliefhole.com. Any way you want to, you can find us. We're on the internet. So If you really are feeling confident, you can record on your phone the actual encounter. Mm-hmm. And then send it to our email. Right, or computer or whatever you got. Yeah, just send us a recording, guys. But if you're shy, just you can write in. Just try to write it so it's compelling. Yeah, if you get, feel free to <laughs> add, add, write it so add, add a good amount of detail so we can really get a full understanding of your story and, and where you're coming from. But um, we love your guys' write-ins. It really 
helps color our show and our perspectives yeah. on these kinds of phenomena. And um, we'll definitely do a, a bigger episode on abductions. There's a lot of fun stuff to get into, a lot of interesting stuff. <laughs> a lot of right. fun, fun stuff. I the wrong word. This is a serious subject yeah, for a lot of people. Yeah. We, we should note that. It's, I mean, it's fun because it's, it's compelling, it's I guess. It's mysterious and interesting. Yeah. It's fun in that way, but it is serious. There are people that really get messed up right. from this PTSD stuff. PTSD right. experiences. It happens a lot. Yeah. And at least that's what, you know, Well, this is one seems. of those things, it's one of those mysteries where like, you know, I remember being little and our friend Brian would come over and we would spend uh, nights, hours at night in the cornfield behind our parents' house, just shining flashlights in the sky, hoping right. to attract some craft to pick us up. Really? You know? That's smart. But when you're young- It's like and, intergalactic hitchhiking. <laughs> right. That'd be fun. Or um, intergalactic bees nest poking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, when you're that young, you don't you're not thinking about the consequences of the possibilities. You're thinking about you know the Disney version of you know right. or Spielberg's ET or something where I want to experience something. Yeah, uh, today I would not be doing that. I don't think I would be if I saw. Although I do, I will say I still like if I see a weird light in the sky. Please be. UFO. Sometimes I flash my headlights in case yeah. you know. I just need something to happen. Yeah, it's about time. But the episode is not over, friends. We have a great interview coming up right after this. Yes, with the great Daniel Krauss. Yes, his latest book, Bent Heavens, we get in deep on that. Uh, best-selling author, uh, co-wrote Shape of Water, the novelization with Guillermo del Toro. Troll Hunters on Netflix wrote for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, he's got some exciting stuff coming out we're going to get into towards the end of the episode. Yeah, he's also going to be helping to finish the uh, much-anticipated novel, by uh, George A. Romero, who wrote, who basically created the idea of the zombie, the modern day zombie, who apparently had created it inspired by actual fact and stories about the zombie in Africa, which we'll, we actually get into a little bit towards the end of the interview. So you guys have to stick around for that. But there's uh, something to do with hoodoo magic and blowfish poison, all these things where witch doctors would actually bring people back to life, supposedly use them as slave labor. A lot of interesting, yeah. fascinating uh, reality to the this root story of zombieism, if you will. And so that we're going to get into that later, later on in the interview. So stick around, guys. The interview was really enjoyable to do, and we hope to have him back on at some point. So hope you guys enjoy that. And what do you guys say in the break we uh tease a little uh, expansion episode oh good idea sounds like a plan man cool well you guys are going to hear a little bit from our expansion episode that we are about to record actually on the georgia guidestones a cryptic set of granite monuments in uh georgia uh that supposedly shine a light on the plans of the uh the elite oh uh, allegedly, it ties Glad in. Glad left it out there for us. Uh, what's, a lot of what's going on now, a lot of conjecture about you gotta it. got to tell people what you're doing. It's part of the, nod, part of the rules. Exactly. That's, and that's one of the arguments for the, this, this uh, cryptic structure with these kind of Ten Commandments of the New Age or the New World Order, however you want to look at it. Um, it's both looked at as like the most holy place for people that are into like the age of reason, right, with these commandments. And it's also looked at to be the, one of the most evil places if you consider some of the commandments pointing at uh, depopulation and eugenics and these kinds of things. So we're going to get into that, into the expansion, but it's a fascinating story, uh, including the mystery of who created it, who was R.C. Christian that expansion. paid for it to be built in the expansion <laughs> episode. So if you guys aren't an expansion-level uh, patron, check our website out, bluefold.com, and click on the Patreon button and sign up to be a patron. You guys can get every bonus episode every time we record a regular episode. Yeah, if, you're, if you love the show and you're, you're really digging the episodes, you want more, you're really only getting like a third, uh, maybe a little more than a third, but... At least less than a half of the content if you're not expansion level. That's very true. And we're going to be putting out more and more uh, as the days go on. So you guys uh, check it out. And thanks for being here. And stick around after the break when we get into it with Daniel Krause. Expansion episode, Georgia Guidestones. Access granted. And he disappeared. The mysterious man who who uh, what was his name? R.C. Christian. R.C. Christian, which admittedly written in stone is a pseudonym. Wait, and it's not Christensen. No, R.C. Okay. Christian. Um, so we're gonna get into him, the mystery of of the creator of these enigmatic stones in Georgia. But let's get a, let's get a little bit into what these are. Yeah, what we're talking about Describe here. Describe them. So if you haven't heard about this, this is a structure, a monument created in 1980. And I thought it was interesting, John, because uh, it was erected a year to the day that you were born, one year before, March 22nd. Oh, wow. 1980. Really? Wow. Interesting that you wanted to cover it. Yeah, that is interesting. It must be a sign. That's kind of weird. Yeah, it ties into you being a hybrid from the first mm -hmm. uh, part of the like episode. a little nod from the universe. I wonder if universe. the aliens built this. 
I don't. Well, maybe R.C. Christian was a, could have been an alien, a Drakillian. He's I love one of those people who goes. <laughs> Yeah, and his, off his face comes face. off. Uh-huh. <laughs> his face comes off. <laughs> face off. Delicious. Yes, he's, a, Nick, he's a Nicholas Cage. Um, but yeah, so you know, part of the mystery is this figure that erected these stones. I guess I can. I, I'll describe the stones. Yeah, first. what are the stones? Okay, so there'll be a picture in our show notes, guys. Any of you who have the internet might have googled it already. Um, it is essentially uh, four large pillars uh, in, a, in, in a pinwheel formation. Um, s- set up vertically, surrounding like a three. surrounding a center pillar. Well, you're seeing it too much, oh, okay, okay. Chris. Don't interrupt me. I'm describing the Sorry. pillars. So there's these four large stones, kind of rectangular uh, in pinwheel fashion, uh, with a center stone in the middle, and then a uh, platform on top, like a capstone kind of. Yeah, capstone, like a, but it's like a flat square or rectangle. Um, now on these stones, what makes what makes these stones so controversial are the in- inscriptions. In the stones, and we're going to get to those inscriptions um, coming up here. Cool. In yeah, detail. it kind of has that like Stonehenge kind of look. Mm-hmm. These are pretty big, right? Like how tall? Like seven feet, eight feet, nine feet? These are, uh, oh wow, nineteen feet. Yes. Wow, that's pretty tall. Or major. I didn't realize they're like two stories. Well, the whole thing with the capstone yeah. on top is nineteen feet three inches. Uh, the four major stones you see in pinwheel formation around. The center stone are 16 feet, four inches. So it's That's, very tall. Yeah, a lot taller than I thought they'd be. Yeah, a monumental undertaking um, for this granite company. Maybe they had some help from the Coral Castle guy. Oh, Ed Leeds Gallon. That'd be, yeah, an episode that'd be a great do. episode. Um, anyway, so let's let's get to the... Uh, yeah, what did they say on them? What's okay, so, so controversial? The inscriptions are what are really controversial. And we'll get more into um, the, the mysteries of its structure and the, the character and what it points to today with some of the stuff going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the inscriptions because this is, of course, where it gets real jelly. Uh what? Yeah, it gets jelly. It gets, okay. it gets you know, squishy. Slimy? Interesting. All right, so... Gravy. Uh, <laughs> gravy. Okay, gravy, so these inscriptions baby. are inscribed on these four, um, these four stones. I think it's eight different languages. Oh, yes. Welcome back, Beliefflings. Before we begin our interview with best-selling author Daniel Krauss, here's a small sampling of his storytelling from his latest book, Bent Heavens. Enjoy. The alien was roughly five feet tall and humanoid. You could wrap a hand around its tiny tube of a neck, which somehow supported a spherical head almost reptilian in its lack of a forehead. Two eyes as large as baseballs protruded from the shallow sockets and jerked in independent directions. The irises were of such crystalline blue that Liv had to force herself to look at the tiny nostril notches and mousehole ears. The being continued to chirp, though its mouth was no beak. It was a lathered, gnashing turmoil of wet palate and too much bone. The teeth were jumbled, askew, jutting at odd angles. What this mess of teeth might be able to chew was impossible to say. Let's go, Liv pleaded. It's not getting up, Doug whispered. It's hurt. How else, Liv had to admit, could you interpret the thing's writhing? Its chest, no wider than that of a child's, beat up and down under a set of exoskeletal ribs. What looked like a heart, a throbbing brown bag, was tucked beneath the sternum, as vulnerable as an unpunctured egg yolk. Farther down, Liv saw purple lungs inflate and deflate in fright. The ribs weren't the only exposed bones. Yellow knobs crested from the flesh at the elbows, knees, knuckles, and shoulders. From the scapulas dangled two scrawny arms, the armpits webbed with veined membranes. The arms ended in thick, three-fingered hands, the left of which was squeezed shut, tight as a rock. There's zip ties, Doug said, on the bench right beside it. Doug, no. Doug licked his lips, emboldened himself with urgent mutters, then crept forward. The alien's huge eyes twitched. Its heart flexed harder. Doug darted and snatched a handful of black plastic ties. The thing chirped and drew back against the wall, but its cycling legs couldn't find purchase in the tangle of tarp. We hope you enjoyed this reading from Bent Heavens by Daniel Krauss. 
To find out where you can get a copy of his book, check out the link in the show notes. Or you can visit danielkraus.com. And now for our interview with master storyteller, Daniel Kraus. Hey, how's it going? This is Jeremy from Beliefful. Hey, what's up? Not too much, man. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well, I think. (laughs) Surviving the quarantine? Yes, I am surviving it pretty well. Um, I I don't leave the house very often anyway. Right. I feel you on that. (laughs) Sounds familiar. There's three of us here, by the way. We are are three brothers. Hi, Daniel. Oh, wow. (laughs) (laughs) We'll try not to inundate you with three voices at once. Try to dial it back, but uh, yeah, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, yeah, it's it's my pleasure. Um, uh, yeah, so it's pretty much all normal here. <laughs> yeah, your routine hasn't changed much, I imagine, as far as writing and. Are you still operating as an essential business with your books? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to tell them real quick what our show is about? Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with our show. Uh, Basically, we mostly cover the uh, paranormal, supernatural, some conspiracy. UFOs. UFOs. Yeah. So definitely in the same line with what your your book, which is great, by the way. Yeah. I spent the last 48 hours in Bluffton, Illinois, my brain. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Fastest I've ever read a book, but I digested every word. I loved your writing style, man. Very poetic. The descriptions in there was just very um, fresh. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, it's my second book set in that town. Oh, cool. Um, and sort of my third. There's, uh, I kind of consider Bent Heavens the third book in an unofficial trilogy that all takes place in that town, which is in Iowa, not Illinois. Uh, oh, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> so it's, uh, well, uh, you know, it's one of them states in the middle. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's Rodders, Scowler, and then Bent Heavens are, are all set around that town. Oh, that's interesting. Are there any, so Chris has read the book. I haven't got to read it yet. Um, We just have the one copy and I'm a big procrastinator, Uh, but Mm -hmm. I watched some interviews and so, yeah, I'm interested. I did not know it was uh, the third book in a, in a trilogy. Are there, are there aspects kind of connective threads or characters that overlap? Um, Yes, but it's not, it's, you know, more along the sort of gentle reference variety. Right. There's not really shared characters it's more locational so sort of like the same universe in a way but not overlapping characters exactly exactly cool. there may be the occasional sort of hooded reference to another character but easily not by name now you're from you're from iowa right right is this the town that you were raised in or is this inspired by the town or it's certainly inspired by it uh my town was a little bit stranger. I grew up in Fairfield, Iowa, which is a really peculiar town. It's the home <laughs> of the Maharishi uh, University of Management, which is, you know, you often see David Lynch sort of talking about his transcendental meditation right. foundations and stuff like that. That's all based in Fairfield, Iowa. So it's a heavily, it's a, it's a, it was a weird place to grow up. It, so half the town is just small town Iowans, farmers, and whatnot, and the other half is meditators from all over the world. Wow. You know, and there's in the center of town, there's these two giant golden domes where every day uh, people will. Or I think it was at five o'clock. I'm not sure. People will stream out of their homes with pillows to go meditate <laughs> together in these giant domes. That is odd. Interesting. Weird. Yeah, I don't think. Uh... When I think of Iowa, I don't think uh, the state of transcendental meditation. Yeah, it is. Interesting. They chose that location because it was, you know, healthy. It was sort of away from the city and away from the smog. Right. And so uh, Blouton is sort of Fairfield minus the meditation half. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that could take his stories in a whole different direction, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. It's kind of growing up in two worlds at the same time as far as that there's sort of a surreal aspect to your hometown then. That's interesting. It, it is very surreal, and it's got good points and bad points. Uh, generally, I think it's a positive. It was a very multicultural place to grow up, um, which is unusual for a small town in Iowa. Right. It, it had, you know, I think when I was growing up, especially when I was little, there was definitely a lot of tension. I think there was, you know, I would hear of sort of outsiders, S.E. Hinton-style rumbles between the the townies who were the the ordinary Iowans and uh, the Ruse, which was short for guru. And so you had these two factions, the townies and the Ruse. And really by the time I was in high school or college, it kind of 
you know, generally smoothed over and eventually Fairfield had their first Rue mayor. And the Rue's, by the way, sort of reclaimed the word Rue. Like they sort of embraced it after a while. So it, for, it was like a derisive term. Right. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Our, our own derisive term sort of for a while, but then they sort of embraced it. And, Interesting. Yeah, I'd never heard that as like a slur. Yeah. <laughs> I think kangaroo, you know. Well, probably reference to guru. I obviously, imagine. yeah. We're obviously, we're, we're from Ohio, small town in Ohio. So no, very small okay. town. Not a lot of gurus here. So I'd never heard that particular uh Expletive, but yeah, that's interesting. It it sounds a lot like. Have you seen the the documentary Wild Country? Wild Wild, Wild, Wild Country, Country, I think. I think I have. It's it's some of those uh, Netflix documentaries are sort of blurred in my head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they pump them out. Yeah, yeah. It sounds very similar as far as the you know small oh, town yes. and then the introduction yes, very of very similar, very similar, minus all the guns. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, okay. So speaking of your of your hometown, since our show is is primarily based around kind of the reality or the potential reality of, of these kinds of subjects. Um, obviously, like we grew up watching, you know, Spielberg and reading Stephen King and movies like Ghostbusters and um, all that kind of stuff inspired us in the direction to look look at this topic in kind of a, a more practical sense or just the, the curious kind of open-minded uh, look at, at a potential reality. And so anytime I watch a movie that's fiction, I always wonder, you know, um, I guess I would put this question to you, like, is this kind of sci-fi fantasy genre a literary device for you to explore ideas, or do you have kind of an interest in the a potential underlying reality to the phenomenon? I think in this case, it's um, it's a way to express certain ideas. Right. It, this book, uh, Ben Heavens, came more out of wanting to tell a certain kind of story and then using sort of the, I don't know, the tropes or mores of science fiction and alien um, ideas and culture sort of to wrap around that. Uh, mostly to get an effect of sort of the idea of there being an other, right. you know. So it was more about that, trying to establish something that felt that could be a foreign presence. Right. Um, yeah, that came through well, I thought, in your book. What I loved about your book, Ben Heavens, was that I, I read science fiction and horror, but what I loved about this was you're not hit over the head with the science fiction tropes and those sorts of things and the motifs. It's not constant throughout. Even in the writing, when there's description, metaphor related to like, I think there's one line about um, um she runs out of the the shed, the workshop that becomes who, who runs the out armory. The, I'm sorry. Uh, does that live? The, yeah, I guess we haven't set up the story yet. Um, do you want to set up the story? We can talk more about the book because I've I got some things I would like to discuss about the uh, the message. Yeah. I thought was great. Yeah, I could talk briefly about it. It's um, it's about a uh, high school age student, a girl named Liv, and her friend, sort of her old friend Doug, and uh, Liv's father once disappeared for a few days, and he's a high school teacher and came back, you know, sort of. Uh, jabbering and naked in the town square saying he had been abducted by aliens and then of course no one believed him and then it, he disappears again this time for good so in the, in the subsequent uh, year or two two or three years as she grows up her and Doug sort of in honor of her dad go around the property and reset these crazy alien traps that he had put everywhere because he had become paranoid that the aliens were going to come back and come after him and his family so he the, in the woods around their sort of country house he built all these crazy traps and then you know right when Liv is on the edge of just destroying the traps because he's sick of it and wants to move on <laughs> They catch an alien, and so Doug and uh, Liv have to decide what to do about it. And they sort of decide to torture it to sort of get information right. about what happened to the dad. So they they kind of take the darkest route possible, and the book is sort of you know about why someone would do that and the sort of intellectual and emotional and mental contortions they would they would go through to to find that an acceptable route right yeah and i think you know it's fascinating the the concepts that you address in the book like the trap you know you have the literal traps that her dad created and then there's you know the traps that Liv finds herself in both of her own creation and just her past you know, with Doug, and uh, I don't want to get too many spoilers away, but the arcs of the characters, a lot of surprising turns, you know, really makes you wonder about motive, 
right. and about, you know, the good intentions and sometimes the dark results of good intentions, the unexpected results when you think you're doing the right thing. It was just, it was a really great read, I think, that had, it had the wonderful science fiction, you know, backdrop, but it, it was really more, in my opinion, a, uh, a study of um, human nature, which I thought was really fun to read. Right, right. And that's kind of all my books sort of focus on that, whether they sort of feel like sci-fi or horror or fantasy, really, I tend to use those as sort of genre faints in some ways, uh, right. so that you, you kind of feel like, you know, The Shape of Water is a good example. So you, you sort of think, okay, this is a monster movie about um, the creature from Black Lagoon type thing. Uh, but really, it's, it, that's that's kind of a, a faint. It's a, it's a misdirect. Right. Uh, it's really about something else. So I, that's kind of almost what I base my career on, sort of using genre as, uh, I don't want to say trick, because it's much more effective right. than that. I love these genres. Uh, but sort of to use the tropes that you expect to see and twist them. Well, that's what I think makes it such a good story. It's it's what keeps, you know, I think it in the mind of the reader for weeks and months, years later, is when you, you have this sort of messages and those sort of, you're instilling those sort of concepts and the, the questions about those concepts within that backdrop. Right, and about people, not just not just a monster story. Right, and the characters, I gotta say, like, I love the dialogue. I laughed out loud several times. Uh, I heard it. It was very <laughs> it was very genuine dialogue. A lot of times, and especially, I think, in fantasy sci-fi drama, there's a lot of heavy di- like heavy-handed dialogue, sometimes disingenuous. With yours, it felt very natural, very human, and I think that gave it some wit that I don't usually find in a lot of the, the sci-fi uh, novels that I read. Yeah, well, I mean, generally, uh, with maybe one exception, all of my books are really grounded in day-to-day reality. So I, 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 I can't, who knows? I mean, I like to, <laughs> I like to stretch out. So, you know, maybe one day I'll write something that's sort of high fantasy or something. Right. But I tend to want us to be very realistic yeah. uh, and very sort of gritty and, you know, naturalistic dialogue as part of that. Oh yeah, there was an interesting point, uh, Chris. You were telling me about the part in Bent Heavens, the description of the alien. Is that what it was? There's oh, something yeah. that you mentioned about the traps that sounded. Um, oh, well, one thing I loved about the armory, which is you know the shed that lives Dad when he gets back, Lee Lee Fleming from his uh, abduction experience. Um, but I don't give too much away. But when he gets back and he kind of converts his uh, shed, this was an English professor that goes and comes back and starts getting books that teach him how to build medieval uh, weapons right. and traps, mm-hmm. all of like natural resources. And uh, what I loved about that, I ha- was having these flashes to, I don't know if you've seen the film Evil Dead or not, but the character of Ash, oh, of that sort of oh, that you know, naming like, of the weapons, that's sort of like giving them power. That's sort of like, yeah. I love that aspect of it. It just, you know, it's the book has a lot of uh, dark and really important elements and concepts to it, but there's also a lot of vivid almost um, sort of fun adventure mixed in, which yeah. is what keeps you going, I think, while you're reading. I just really enjoy that aspect of it. Yeah, the uh, naming of the weapons was uh, important to me. I learned sort of early on in my career that there's something really powerful about proper nouns. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got this uh, book, Rotters, which is my second book that's about um, this sort of underground network of modern-day grave robbers Right. Yeah. that exists beneath our feet essentially we don't know about them oh that's interesting and i came up with this concept at the beginning of that where they were sort of like knights and instead of swords they had shovels and they named their shovels so everyone yeah. has so as soon as i came up with that it really brought certain things alive it really specified things and it it made it sh- when people name things it, you kind of understand what they mean to them right or what they want them to mean or what they want how they wanted to reflect upon them. You know, if you have a sword and you call it the devastator, (laughs) whether or not it's a good sword, like I see what you're, I see what you're going for there. Uh, So i like the idea of, um, so yeah, so that sort of carried on into uh, Ben Havens with the naming of the weapons. Um, It's, I don't know. I, I think there's something evocative about it. I didn't have to do it, but it's absolutely. It's, um, Especially wasn't the uh, Chris? You mentioned that the because I hadn't read it yet, but the uh, bear trap was it named amputator? Yeah, I'm not sure it was specifically a bear trap, but it had the sort of sort of effect that a bear trap would have. But yeah, the amputator that was great, right? But yeah, it definitely brings it to life. I feel like even more so. Well, it gives it. It almost gives the weapons their own kind of uh, mystique, a uh, storyline, or in the sense that they they are a character at that point. It feels like where right. They it have lives, their own power. Lives weapon towards the end that comes back into play. They're sort of these, yeah, you're right. They kind of, in my opinion, become sort of 
characters unto themselves, sidekicks in a way. <laughs> yeah. There's power imbued in them, which is cool. Yeah, and that's exactly what there's there's meaning imbued in them. If right. it's just like Liv picked up her dagger, there's not a lot to that. But right. if you say he picked up her and it's got some, you know, really fancy name from history, right? Then you can see how how you can start to build your own myths around that and how you can draw strength from the object. Exactly. Well, let me ask you this question. I, I know our listeners probably want to know, because we always cover the potential reality, like I mentioned about the supernatural and stuff. When you were a kid, did you, I guess when you were a kid or even today, do you have any beliefs personally in the paranormal ghosts, the existence of extraterrestrials, or any, any experiences when you were younger? Because obviously your imagination can build out ideas when you're younger. Maybe but, not even beliefs, but maybe an unexplained experience that to this day you're still just kind of scratch your head. Yeah, uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, generally, I'm a, I'm a pretty hardcore cynic. Right. Uh, I I don't believe in most things. Well, thanks for coming on the show today, and we will. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I do believe. I mean, I think you have to believe in extraterrestrial life. I mean, whether or not it's been anywhere near Earth is a is a open question. But right. you know, the universe is infinite, so there's there's something out there. So I definitely, I, you know, I think you have to be just scientifically, you have to be. Uh, foolish not to think there's something else in the infinity of space. Right. Uh, so I believe in that. I don't really believe in ghosts per se, and I haven't had any uh, experiences aside from, you know, sort of urban legend, creepy stories that I don't believe in, but are creepy just because they're supposedly happening in your hometown or something. Right. Uh, the only t- thing I can point to, and, I, and again, I'm not convinced by it, but I've had one like powerfully creepy experience in my life that I don't believe is ghosts, but if it, it could be. I mean, it's the closest I've come to it. My wife and I were traveling in rural Scotland. We were right around the area where the Wicker Man was shot. Oh, creepy. So we, we mostly just wanted to, to travel around North Scotland, but we both love the Wicker Man, so we went out there. We visited the, the Wicker Man's feet, which are still there, sort of on the coast. And uh, if your listeners have seen the Wicker Man, there's the, the hotel. There's a big hotel that's at, the main character stays at. There's a bar there. Oh, just to clarify, you're talking about the original or the of Nicolas course. Cage? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> of, of course would be the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes, how dare you? <laughs> right? <laughs> So we stayed a night in that hotel, and it's not in a, I mean, it's in a, technically a town, I think, but it's, you know, it's like a half a block of a few stone buildings. I mean, it's very, very small. And we had this lovely little room. We were probably the only people in the hotel. And that night, there was just this, and we both felt it independently and talked about it the next day, just this feeling of incredible dread in that hotel like we were both chilled to the bone the bathroom was down this weird little crooked completely dark hallway that neither of us wanted to go down (laughs) and uh it's you know i think it's probably the mind running away from it you know running away with itself that we were just in this completely silent room in this completely silent hotel in this completely silent corner of the country yeah it was but it was really creepy it's a creepiness that i I uh, had never really been able to shake. It was so palpable. Interesting. Yeah, obviously I'm not. So gonna you put, believe in ghosts? Yeah. <laughs> obviously <laughs> I'm not going to put more weight onto that your experience than you think you have. But it is interesting. That's so. That's the, the you've have you ever felt anything like that before or since? That sort of level of unexplained emotion. No, uh, that's it. I mean, I no, I haven't really experienced anything that I haven't been able to explain away. Right. It's interesting because specifically the experiences like that, I mean, I've heard a lot of you know stories and people I know that have experienced stuff and I, I haven't had anything that extreme as far as that dread feeling, but it's interesting when you hear those accounts and they actually take place in like all things considered a normal home, right? Or yeah. like a build, like an office building, but you don't want to go in the yes. broom closet, you know, because you feel there's like- something about that broom closet. Like there's the <laughs> devil in there. Yeah, like it's, but I totally get what you're saying when you're out in the middle of nowhere and, you know, you already, mind is already kind of set up for that sort of environment. Well, that's my favorite kind of stuff is the stuff that the events that happen in really uh, unspooky places. There's this great book you're probably aware of called The Poltergeist by William G. Roll. Oh, yeah. That, you know, there's a big chunk of the book that's 
dedicated to this very scientific uh, study of poltergeist activity in this in this uh, warehouse that sells novelty items. That's interesting. Like plastic, you know, alligator ashtrays or you know whatever. Like and, Spencer's so gifts. This, exactly the stupidest stuff. <laughs> right. But it's it's all the creepier because of that. Because it's just not a place. It's not a haunted castle. It's not a cobwebby mansion. It's just a regular place. And so the idea of like a haunted closet in an, a broom closet in an office building is actually much more appealing to me. I agree. Absolutely. It's the terror of the mundane. The mixture of the extraordinary within the ordinary, I think, is what the... Yeah, that, that contrast is really what makes things compelling. That's the compelling stuff, yeah. Uh, but I do want to say, uh, you know, this this repeats kind of not complete throughout the book, comes back and forth. But what you're saying about skepticism, which I totally understand your point of view. But I love this quote that you have in here. So probably not referring to, you know, I want to believe, but from oh, what was his name? James Galvin, Resurrection Update. Yeah. But you have throughout the book and towards the end, the quote, perhaps you didn't realize anything can happen under a sky like this. And I like that because, I mean, for me, the kind of person who wants to believe, you know, which is probably not how you meant it. But I guess it's that conspiracy that you talk about in the book, the conspiracy when you're writing and when you're a reader, you come together to sort of create the takeaway. And for me, that was kind of the takeaway, like, yeah. you know, anything is possible. Obviously, the the twist and turns, I don't want to give too much away, but something you might believe then changes into something else that maybe you realize wasn't actually the case. But um, I do love that line. And I didn't look it up, but um, is that a real work yes. from James Galvin? Okay. Yes, I a Resurrection Update is a collection of his poems. Awesome. I'll have to check that out for sure. I love the the little quotes in there from that work. I really enjoyed. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, you're right about the interpretation of that quote, but you're also, but it's also true that it's, you know, it's meant to be taken literally. Uh, you know, what happens in the book without spoilers, I think is within the realm of possibility. The idea of aliens is within the realm of possibility. Uh, anything can happen. Yeah. What was the, uh, sorry, this just popped in my head. Um, you were talking about, Chris, uh, when you were reading, there was a quote. I was going to say, what was the ending? <laughs> How does it end? <laughs> no, what was the, there was a quote by uh, that scientist, uh, which I don't know if the quote was real or not. I was trying to look more into him, but it was Anatoly, uh, the guy who was hit yes. by the particle beam. Oh, right. It seemed like yes. it was based on an actual event, but I think the fictionalized version took it to a more conspiratorial Place. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you, Daniel, about that. Was that I was really fascinated by that line. What was the line exactly, or something to the effect of that he was involved in some sort of uh, government project? Right, Daniel, do you want to uh, set that up for Jeremy? Because he didn't read it like a lazy man. Well, I can try. It was, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I remember the, you know, you know, do I write these books? It's years ago. Right, right, right. Oh, I totally get but it. Yes, yeah. I, I believe it's Anatoly Bogorsky. Yeah, that's, that's right. That sounds right. And he, he essentially uh, was involved uh, in the 70s. He was involved in a Soviet uh, mishap with a, like a particle accelerator or something. Right. And essentially received an incredible amount of radiation. And uh, it, it was, I think, sort of malformed because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like swelling of the face or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although you, Jeremy, you were looking into some interesting stuff where there's, I mean, there's now there's, yeah, I guess he was still alive, uh, at least up until recently. I'm not sure if he is yeah. currently, but uh, um, yeah, the two interesting things I read. One was, well, first of all, there's a picture of where the beam kind of went in and it burned out that back of his hair on one yeah. side and it hit the one, one half of his brain, That's supposedly. Awful. And uh, it, the, to this day or recent, more recent pictures, um, that side of his face hasn't aged. There's no wrinkles. Well, allegedly. Well, according to the photo. And right, then uh, right, right. Uh, the other interesting thing was that apparently because it was a particle beam accelerator and went through his part of his brain, it uh, allowed him to start speaking to entities in another, another dimension. What? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, of course, I tried to fi like, you know, right. find Where out if, he, if he had actually said that anywhere. Right, right. And it was like on three different, you know, completely out there story. websites. But uh, yeah, but I was, so I was curious about that. Yeah, I think largely because it happened in Soviet Russia, there uh, was just a lot of secrecy around it. Right. right. And so that led itself to all sorts of uh, wild theories, but it's, but it's fascinating. I think he was like the only person who's, you know, who <laughs> this has ever happened to right? and lived. So it's, you know, it's feels like the origin story of something. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. It's very like toxic waste, uh, you know, mutant exactly. spider bites. <laughs> um, yeah. I was going to ask you, uh, oh yeah. As far as looking into these different topics or whatever you're your next story is going to be based on and that kind of thing. What kind of research do you do? Because I, I think I heard somewhere about um, a document you looked up on implants for Ben Heavens, uh, like alien implants. 
I think that might have been a reference to um, a strange book that I found online. Uh, and Those are the best. <laughs> purchased a copy of, yeah. It was, I think, I don't quote me on this, but I guess technically I'm, I'm being quoted on this, <laughs> is I think it's called The Alien and the Scalpel. Okay, yes. And it's, uh, it might be self-published, I'm not sure. If it's not, it's very, very small uh, press. Uh, and there's, and there's some elements in there about, you know, someone having tiny, some sort of potential gadgetry implanted in them from the aliens. Right. But really, there's less about that that I took from it than I was more interested in just the obsessiveness of it. Right. Uh, I'm interested in these types of books where it's just somebody out there who's absolutely obsessed with telling a story. And so they write these, you know, dense books filled with tons and tons of scientific detail and it's impossible to tell if any of it's true right <laughs> and uh, if the person is you know brilliant or a total crackpot but but the document they, they create is just so fascinating regardless yeah in that respect and, and there's so many things like that i feel like where you, especially if you're good with language you know, where you've got a good vocabulary and you know how to craft sentences and, and compelling paragraphs and you can do sort of uh, verbal dodges with real information. Not that this is an example of that. Where you, you, It's hard to parse out potentially factual aspects of the theory or manuscript or whatever they're developing and what is just completely fabrication from their imagination. Right, but I think, but I think it does definitely lend some credibility when the, the document or book is loaded with like graphs and, and data and that kind of thing that builds it up. Um, I, think, I think the guy, I was trying to look this up, and I think it was um, Dr. Lear, Dr. Roger yeah. Lear, uh, who I've seen him in some documentaries and I was just uh, Googling him, but our listeners will know, and you might be familiar with uh, NIDS, who was involved with the, the study at Skinwalker Ranch. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that at all. Super no. paranormal hotspot. There's a show out now about it, but it's it's been in like paranormal lore for you know decades now, or at least since the 90s. But yeah, he was a part of a group of researchers and oh, scientists he was, who were involved with that. Yeah, he was involved that's with NIDS, which is the um, National Institute for Discovery Science. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. But yeah. just to point out that like, yeah, you definitely stumbled across, uh, it sounds like a really dense work that I think our listeners would be interested in looking into as well, maybe as a, an addendum <laughs> to your book. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean- Weirdly enough, if you're looking for a couple addendums to my book, one is probably this, you know, poetry collection. Definitely. The Resurrection Update. And the other one is the aliens and the scalpel. You know, it's just, it's what you say about, you know, being filled with graphs and stuff, you know, that reminds me of William Roll again. Like, that's what's so compelling about his Poltergeist book is it's so scientific. So even if I don't believe it, it's hard you know, our, our brains are just programmed to respond to graphs and charts and uh, right. and Roll's book is filled with them. You know, I think that's, you know, some of the charts I don't even understand. It's just <laughs> the fact that they're there. All the better if you don't. That makes me think, oh, somebody spent a lot of time on this. Right. <laughs> there must be something to it. It's like someone trying to persuade you and they have a wonderful English accent. And you're like, well, he's probably crafts. Yeah, he has crafts <laughs> and has a great sounding voice. <laughs> exactly. That's science. But it is, it is interesting too because it, you know, a lot of the stuff we look into, we, we definitely are open-minded and we give everything the benefit of the doubt. We try to get into the research and try to be skeptical, but also give some leeway. But, you know, in the cases where there's something that's, that seems like it's been in the lore for so long and it seems so intricate, that it seems like it has to be real. And sometimes it's, it's just a combination of those things that gives it its own mythology, where it becomes a story within itself. And that, I think, one of the things I love about doing our show is that I love the the storytelling aspect of it. Not We're not trying to prove that anything's necessarily real. We go in with an open mind, but then the telling of that story where you start to develop and see these mythologies developing on their own. I think that's what I love about uh, these topics. Yeah, self-perpetuating like mythologies are really, really fascinating. Exactly. Yeah, speaking of mythologies and, well, I guess things that span a long time, you're working on a project coming up that's pretty uh, big. Um, I forget the name of it, but it's the kind of uh, ultimate uh, release from the... Oh, the Living Dead series. Yeah, Living Dead. Was it The Living Dead? Is that the name of it? Yeah, the book is called The Living Dead. So this is, uh, you know, my hero really was uh, George Romero. Yes. I grew up with his, literally grew up like, I saw Ned Living Dead when I was like five or six years old. Uh, so I literally grew up with the films of George Romero sort of guiding me. He's my favorite artist of any type of media. And so through the twists of time and fortune and crazy luck, 
um, after, you know, shortly after he died, you know, his manager and wife, you know, were trying to decide what to do with various projects that he was working on and hadn't finished. And there was this zombie epic, this novel, uh, that he was pouring all his energy into that, uh, was unfinished. And they, um, they approached me to see if I'd be interested in finishing it. So, uh, I did. And it's this, you know, it's this giant doorstop of a novel that's sort of Romero's final words on zombies. It, yeah. you know, it, it takes it from, he reboots it uh, back to sort of day one, and then it goes about 15 years into the future beyond that. And it's it's everything he could never do in movies. You know, he was never given budgets to do anything. Um, so it's it's big. It's it's all the cool stuff <laughs> that he and no movie producer would allow uh, him to get away with. Right. Um, but it's also small too. You know, all of Romero's stuff in, in essence is about conflict between humans. Yeah. Uh, and the zombies are really just a catalyst, but it's been like, you know, it's, it's the greatest, you know, honor of my life really to, to be involved with that. It just meant everything to me. It's been pushed because of the coronavirus, but it will now come out in August, August 4th. Cool. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. As far as Corona and everything going on. Yeah. Lots of, lots of books are getting pushed. Yeah. Looking forward to that. Makes well, that, that'll definitely be a book that fe- it's right now feels like a zombie time. I feel oh, like. Oh yeah. There's stuff happening right now that are literal plot points in the book. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. You know, Romero's always way, way ahead of his time. Yeah. And was able to sort of sense, he had this instinct for sniffing out like cultural, especially American cultural weaknesses. And uh, you're definitely living in a Romero year. Right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely feels that. Yeah, a little post-apocalyptic. Yeah. Speaking of films, as I was reading Ben Heavens, I couldn't help but, you know, it was so, so visual. I couldn't help but see the scenes playing out. And there seemed like there were so many aspects to it that just seemed like it would make a really uh, incredible film, like an adventure, especially the beginning. And, you know, as I read and as sort of the the concepts changed behind the work and where we, where the paths were going in the narrative, the, the storyline became more adult and the concepts became uh, deeper. But still there was that overarching, like, adventure sort of mystery yeah, very visual. Mm-hmm. Do you have any any hopes for a film with Ben Heavens? I do, and uh, I'll just leave it at the fact that I can't say anything else about it. Okay, <laughs> that's a good <laughs> sign. Usually a good sign. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to hear news about that. I love the story. Yeah, I think it's um, it's you know, obviously it's a very ends up being a very very dark, yeah, tale. But um, yeah, there is there is something sort of cinematic. It's sort of the flip side of ET. In a yeah, kind of way. yeah. It begins with a sort of Goonies feel, ET feel. Mm-hmm. You know the mystery. And then one of the moments I loved in the book, because what I've always loved about science fiction films was the reveal of the mystery or the reveal to a friend or someone who finally believes the reveal that you're giving away. Right. And that scene where Liv calls Doug. Right. And he's like, "I'll be right there." That moment, you know, where yeah. at that point, you know, all the characters arc and turn. But at that point, Doug is sort of the. Uh, he reminds me a mixture of between. I'm sure you're probably familiar with most of these movies, but like Vern from Stand By Me with a mixture of art uh-huh. from the Burbs, like the guy who's always believing in the, the like the yes. neighborhood lore. Yeah, I love art. So I, I really resonated with that moment with that character at that time. It's a it's a great moment to pull out because Doug is, you know, he's the, the true believer. Right. He, he has, he's the only one in town who ever really believed that Lee Fleming had been abducted by aliens. Right. And as partly as a result of that, he's sort of unpopular, an outcast, you know, considered to be sort of a, a chump and a dupe. Uh, but in that one moment, suddenly it switches. And like, who's she going to call? Who's yeah. she going to call Doug? There's only one person to call. Yeah, he's like the, the prepper on the day of the apocalypse. You know, <laughs> the guy who's always right. been the outcast. Like, those kids uh, he's that, the guy that knows about it now. At least at that point in the story, he's like, uh, what's the, the, in the Lost Boys, those, uh, those young oh, kids? Oh, the Frog Brothers? The, right. Kind of that yeah, that feel, right. yeah. I loved that, and and his arc is so fascinating, and his relationship with Liz is so great. I can't say more good things about the character development in this book, but yeah, man. And thank you for the free copy. There's nothing better than oh, a free book. Sure. So, <laughs> sure. Um, I am excited about the uh, the Living Dead the project coming out. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have? Any okay? I you know I, I, this was probably might be annoying from someone who's not a, really a believer in this kind of stuff, but I don't know if you are familiar at all with any of like the original 
inquiry into the 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 idea of the zombie because I, I didn't know this until fairly recently, but I guess there had been um, I want to say like in the 1800s or maybe early 1900s had been some experiences in Africa where are oh, you talking about the blowfish stuff? Yeah, the, I think maybe I, I, a long time ago I saw the movie The Serpent and the Rainbow and I can't remember if that involved blowfish poison. Yeah. Yes, I'm very aware of it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, that fa- I, I was I was always bored by zombies just because it seems so outlandish mm-hmm. to me, and I like my fiction to have a dose of reality. And then, and after hearing some of these stories about like witch doctors who would bury, uh, who would poison a potential you know um, future slave, mind the slave, uh, poison right. them and then bury them close to the road and dig them up, like I, that stuff is fascinating to me. Yeah, the uh, um, so basically it sort of uh, descends from African practices, but mostly it's centered around Haiti, right, and. Uh, it's yeah, and there's an element of there's a certain kind of poison that the blowfish emits, and the serpent in the rainbow is sort of the most popular work about it. Um, the movie is kind of a little off. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time since <laughs> I've seen book. it. Yeah, Bill Pullman or something. Uh, it's, it's a pretty. It's a, I, I kind of like the movie. It's a ambitious first time, and I don't know anyone back then besides Wes Craven would have had the muscle to make that kind of movie. Oh, that was Wes Craven. I didn't even realize that. Yeah, but it's 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 fair, you know if if you care about this kind of thing, it's fairly inaccurate. Um, right. The book that was tremendous. Wade Davis is the author, and um, yeah, the I the story of sort of real life. Haitian zombies and that kind of voodoo, which is different than sort of New Orleans voodoo, right, um, is really really fascinating, and that's something Romero was uh, very um, uh, aware of too. He was a student of that kind of thing too, so he he he'd always correct people who said that he sort of invented the zombie, right? He did sort of invent the the modern concept as we use it, yeah. But he was you know he was well aware that the zombie was a was a concept that comes. A completely different era and uh, locale, and really had nothing to do with what he was doing. Yeah, well, that's really cool. I mean, for me personally, that adds a lot of weight to that just that genre, you know. Oh, that there is like a, a lore behind, yeah, at least a history. Even if it's not, even if it is like unrelated. Kind of a new, you know, he created this newer modern zombie, but just the fact that it was inspired by a, something that could be seen as somewhat similar, you know, would be the impetus for that sort of mythology. I think that's that's what's so cool about it to me. Which is why I'm I'm more interested in that now than I used to be. Yeah, it's you know it's there's this book called The Magic Island by William Seabrook, published in the early 1900s, and it's it's sort of the the book that was is credited for bringing to you know I guess most of the world the first sort of reports, right? You know, the popular reports of um, zombies in Haiti. And there was a, one of the last things George Romero wrote before he died was the uh, introduction to a new edition of that book. Oh, wow. That's so crazy. So he was very plugged into it. And one of the things that uh, we do in The Living Dead, which, you know, by the way, is just a co-author situation. So he had written a portion of the book and I wrote, wrote the pieces that were missing. And so it's a book by both of us. Right. One of the things that we do in the book is we sort of, to some extent, connect the idea of the Haitian voodoo zombie with the sort of Romero zombie and, and find a way to sort of connect them. I like that. Yeah. Kind of putting those threads together, like the original inspiration and then the modern storyline. That's, That's really awesome. cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a freaking fascinating topic. It's, it's, you know, and there's, you know, there's, I mean, if your listeners want to dig into it, there are so many great articles. I mean, you can start with the serpent and the rainbow, but there are other sort of more distilled um, articles out there that you know talk to people who were zombies and you That's know so crazy yeah and it's it's a, it's an amazing it's an amazing uh, set of stories that it's still not well known enough yeah it's funny because we we have different topics we obviously jump around within the show and we debate what topics to go to to go to do <laughs> and uh, I was talking to John and John was like. Yeah, but zombies aren't real, so they're not interesting. And I was like, Yeah, but they kind of are a little bit. Like they kind of yeah. once were, you know, in, in this sense. And well, I mean, not even once were, still are. I mean, this is not something that this is this is not ancient history. This is modern history. It's still, a, is it still a practice? Yeah, it is really. Still a wow, practice. it's terrifying. Um, so you should definitely do an yeah. episode on it. It is happening right now. 
Well, now I'm convinced. Yes. <laughs> that is yeah, crazy. Wow. Well, maybe we'll set that up. If, if you would be interested in coming back on at some point, you know, it would be cool to kind of table that because our, our episodes can be fairly long. It'd be cool to do like interview with you about the, you know, the living dead. And, and then, maybe after the release of the book or something. Yeah, and connect it to an episode on that. That'd be really cool. Yeah, we could. And there's uh, there's a couple uh, really interesting uh, and smart and fun to listen to experts in this topic too. Who, Excellent. Uh, who know who know way better than I do. Well, we might have to ask uh, for those uh, references. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> off area. Yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Absolutely, man. Um, well, hey, is there anything else? Uh, we're running up on forty five or so here. Is there anything else you wanted to get out to the listeners before we? We wrap here. Uh, just that, you know, this is a crazy year for me in the sense that I've got five books out in a 12 month period, which Jeez. is wow. it's total insanity. Uh, yeah, that's ridiculous. So, but, you know, if you want to learn about any of them or my past books, just go to Daniel Kraus. That's K R A U S dot com. And it has, uh, you know, all the various links to social media and all that stuff. Awesome, man. Well, we will have that in the show notes for this episode, guys. So definitely check out his website, check out his books. Yeah, Daniel, just want to say thanks again so much for coming on. Hey, man. My pleasure. Awesome, man. Well, this has been great. And yeah, definitely uh, we'll hit you up again sometime. Yeah, thanks so much, man. All right, guys. Have a good day. All right, take too. it easy, Daniel. Stay safe. See you. All right, guys, that was our interview with Daniel Krauss. Hope you guys enjoyed that. We had a great time having him on and hopefully have him back sometime soon, maybe after he releases that zombie book he Definitely. was talking about. Yeah, that'll be awesome. fun. Come back, Daniel. Yeah. Um, we want to thank everybody who's been supporting us. We're going to read all our patron names up through March. Uh, so, yeah, that we haven't already read on the show. Right, so keep your ears pinned. And if, you, if you've if you missed, if we missed your name, just send us an email, give us a shout out, and we will read it next time. So, Chris, take us away. All right. Emily McMinn. Shauna Brasty. Thanks, Shauna. Chanel? Maya Prado, Vic Voss, Zach Wilkinson, Corey Vandewig, Shana Skinner Magner, David Ortland, David Sanford, Damon, Key Anderson, Cece, Jess Brown, Kyle, Kaylee, Denise Williams, Rick Abney. What, what, uh, Rick? Rubyard. Ruby Road. Ruby Road. Ruby Road. <laughs> Ruby Road. <laughs> Rub your pud. I can't read well. Uh, Sukhvir Singh. Riley Ray. And that's going to wrap us up for March, guys. Quick thank you to Rick for that uh, PayPal donation. We really oh, appreciate he's that. several PayPal donations. Very, did more than one? Oh, yeah. Rick? Three $25 donations. When did that happen? Over the last wow. few weeks or something. Yeah. Really appreciate that. A way we should do a special shout out for the, for the latest PayPal donations. Rick... Nick, Shauna, and uh, Taylor. Taylor. Oh yeah, yeah, thank you guys, and maybe somebody else. Let me let us know if we missed you guys. <laughs> we missed you. Let, yeah. let us Where know. Where is that money, by the way? I took okay. PayPal. It's in my we wallet. Can, maybe we can pay ourselves this time. Yeah, that'd be sure. nice. And save some money for cameras. Yeah, Taylor's donation said for for more gear. So okay, yeah, I guess I should probably put it there. Get a stream working. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, and Rick had the great story that he wrote in with the gnomes, and that that made that episode. So thank yeah. you, Rick and Corey. We mentioned him, but he. Uh, we get a great interview from him about some terrifying shadow person experience and some some hauntings. So we're going to be doing an episode with him with his uh, his story coming out soon. So, and also we actually just recorded the Georgia Guidestones Patreon episode. It was going to be a good one. Yeah, that so was pretty excellent. Go sign up on Patreon and get all our other stuff. And yeah, absolutely do it. All right, guys. Well, we'll see you next time. All right, on the belief hole.